Hey everyone, I just want to take a minute to tell you about my Amazon number one best selling book, Culture of Excellence. How do culture and leadership impact the performance of a team? For the past 30 years, one organization in baseball has stood taller than all of the rest the New York Yankees. In Culture of Excellence, Colin Sumelia, that's me, takes us inside baseball's most successful franchise to uncover compelling and useful lessons in leadership. Culture of Excellence is transformative in its premise. It shares strategies you will want to apply and knowledge you can acquire to effectively improve your team and motivate your people. With three foundational pillars, you can become a more effective leader and build a culture of excellence through stories from the Yankees. And you can purchase your copy of Culture of Excellence from any online retailer. There are hard copy, ebook, and audiobook versions available. You can also purchase a hard copy of the book directly from me, and I will personalize it for you and send you swag items like a bookmark and a sticker. Head over to www.talent409.com backslash culture dash of dash excellence to view all of your options and learn how you can discover your talent altitude through my book, Culture of Excellence. Okay, everyone, welcome back to a special edition of the Dynamic Leaders Podcast. Today, I have two awesome guests with me. Alphabetically, I have Alicia Smith and Melanie Rushing. Ladies, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Thanks for having us, Colin. Yes, thank you. (laughs) Good call going alphabetical. (laughs) (laughs) well i didn't want to make one of you feel like i was playing favorites versus the other so i was like oh let's let's just go alphabetically that'll make things easier we all know alicia's the favorite Uh, yeah yeah. we do no just kidding (laughs) well let's go right into our conversation let's stick with alicia then since she is the favorite and we'll just (laughs) go right into this i want to give you both an opportunity first just to tell the listening audience a little bit about yourself give us some background before we get into more specifics about our conversation so alicia please tell a little bit about yourself and who are you? Sure. Um, again, my name is Alicia Smith. Um, I am a high school softball coach from Michigan. Um, I played high school uh, basketball and softball and went to Western Michigan University to play softball uh, and then was offered a coaching position at a local high school here called Madawan High School near Kalamazoo um, to coach JV from one of my, with one of my former teammates that I played with at Western. And, um, you know, I coached for three years of JV and I instantly caught the bug. Like I had no, I'm like, sure, if you need some help, like I wasn't really, you know, I wasn't born to coach or, you know, I didn't, that wasn't something that I always wanted to get into, but I was burned out of playing. I just didn't want to play anymore. I didn't even join like the softball slow leagues or adult leagues. I didn't want to do that, but it was a way for me to keep that competitiveness going. And, um, after three years, I, uh, in 2001 transitioned to the varsity, uh, coaching position and just, I loved it. And, you know, I look back at my career, uh, it's been quite long now, 23 total years of coaching. And um, I, I didn't really know anything, right? And I didn't know what I didn't know. But um, over the next 10 years, um, w- we competed, but I could never beat those teams, right? The, the local teams was always the rivalry. We lost every single time. Um, fast forward to 2009, and I had a... Uh, we were in a regional semifinal and we were up two one in the seventh inning with one out. And I already started thinking ahead, you know, we were going to quarterfinals. We won this. All we need is two more outs. There's nobody on base. We got this. And two of my best players made mental errors in a row. And I think it took a total of nine pitches and we lost on a, on a double that scored two runs, three, two, we lose, we lose. And at that moment in that time was the worst loss in my career. And I was just so frustrated because we couldn't get over the hump. And uh, we just, we, we were always just good. We were never great. And um, that summer, I, it just was so hard on me. And I, I got an email that the Western Michigan University was starting a coaching sport performance master's program. And I could start taking the first class of sports psychology. Thought, eh, it was three Saturdays, eight hours each. Yeah, I can do that. 10 minutes into this class, I'm like, oh my God, this is what I've been missing. I never had this as a player. I never knew how to recover from failure. I never knew it. And I sure as heck didn't know how to teach my players that or even realize that that was missing. But after, after a while, I, um, she recommended a book, uh, the winner's manual, um, by Jim Trestle. He's a former Ohio state 
football coach. Um, and being a Michigan fan, it was a little bit hard to, uh, to read at first, but, but I dove right in and he had created a basically a three reminder notebook for his players with all sorts of information in it. So I took that idea and made it my own and started trying to teach the mental part of the game starting in 2011. And uh, I think that just, just learning about it and starting to implement it and trying to implement it changed my program. It changed my program, it changed my coaching. Um, I was blessed with a great set of athletes during that time frame. Um, we ended, ended up winning the state championship in 2011, which was a year after, I think I got my dates wrong, it's 2010, not 2009, but um, a year after that horrible loss, completely turned everything around. And I credit my players and, and everyone around me for buying in and taking a chance, right? Um, a couple years later, uh, I met Mel on the recruiting trail. She was recruiting one of my players who she didn't get. She went to Columbia instead, sorry, Mel. But uh, Mel and I started talking and her husband, Brian, was with her sometimes in the recruiting. We just got chatting and we talked a lot about the mental part of the game. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love it. I have a master's in sports psych. And I was like, oh my God, let's have coffee. So we became Starbucks buddies and went to Starbucks a lot. And, we, and I showed her my notebook and I think she still has it actually. <laughs> but, uh, and we just started talking the mental part of the game, you know, and, and then she, she moved to Florida, uh, cause her husband got a job and, uh, but that's how we met. And that's how the, the discussion started. Um, she was in Florida and t- seven years later, I'm at a conference and I'm like, I was just, you know, our program had done well, but I personally was like, man, I am so sick of the corporate job. It's not my favorite thing to do. And if I could get paid to coach, I would totally do it make a living, right? So um, I'm sitting in a, a conference. I can't remember the speaker at the time, but she said something like, you just got to follow your dreams. And I said, well, I got to stop talking and just do it. So I texted Mel literally in the middle of this and said, I'm ready to, to work with you at any time. You tell me. And uh, she goes, well, uh, you could come down to Florida. And I said, well, next weekend, I'm going to Italy for work. And then you have these two weekends before softball starts. So pick, pick one. She goes, let me talk to Brian. And 30, 30 minutes later, we, we picked a weekend and we started, I flew down and we started brainstorming what became, she had already started Mental Sweet Spot, but what really became the partnership of Mental Sweet Spot for four days, we did nothing but whiteboard and talk and, and that's where we are today. So I'll let Mel, you know, kind of take her, take it on from there in, in her background. Yes, Mel, take it away. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm like flashing back to all these things. <laughs> she literally came down when my first was a baby. So I'm like, here, honey, take the kid. We're going to be outside with the whiteboard. <laughs> but it was very good that I found her because um, you'll see in the story. Well, it'll say it started as an idea and it would not be a business. <laughs> it was not for her. So my journey in sports like actually started pretty early. I was fortunate to have a coach um, at 14 U. So I'm like 14 years old who they set up sessions, they did mental training with all the teams. And they taught us a bunch of mental skills and it was basically heads up baseball because they actually worked with Ken Revisa. How cool is that? Um, so learn all that stuff and it still didn't help. <laughs> so pretty sure because it was at like Applebee's or something, I was way more excited about the potato skins than learning about red light, yellow light, green light. Um, but it really did stick with me. And I was the kid who needed it. Classic perfectionist, overthinker, super hard on myself. So when we hear that these days, I think it's even more prevalent now with the youth coming up with such high expectations and access to everything. So then they expect to be able to be really good at everything right away. It's been really interesting to see it keep coming up. So first time was 14U and then, okay, let it go. Just go focus on softball came back up again when I was being recruited and my coach looked at me, he'd coached me for two years at this point. And he was just like, I can't get you recruited because every time I tell you a coach is coming, you completely change. (laughs) I was like, I don't know. But again, I knew what was wrong. Didn't know how to fix it. So fortunately for me, I found D3 and I freaking love it. So we got Alicia with her D1 experience. I had D3. It's really cool to see how our stories kind of blend really well. Uh, But got there, I lucked into, no one was at my position, (laughs) so I got to start my freshman year, did pretty well, felt like I was like getting momentum, and then of course, (laughs) they figure you out after freshman year, (laughs) they start to get your number, then you realize, oh, maybe I'm not that good. Um, So by my junior year, it's crumbling again, and my coach finally looked at me and was like, I don't know what else to do with you. 
Like you're so hard on yourself. It's starting to affect the team. Cause I was an upperclassman at the time, one of three on a team of 18. She's like, I need you to be a better leader. So I got benched. <laughs> Sat my butt on the bench. My dad was like, are you, what? Are you okay? Like, really? <laughs> like, yep. I know. So it worked out for the better. Cause I was like, you know, finally I'm, I wasn't allowed to come to practice. I wasn't allowed to dress nothing for an entire week. So I finally bought the book, mind gym read it page to page. I had highlights. I had those little sticky tabs that you put into it. <laughs> I was running through everything. Like, this is the gym. It's like actionable stuff with stories that are relatable. And then I get, took it into it and completely flipped my career around. It was at the end of my junior year. So that the end was okay. But senior year, oh, it was the best. I was such a better leader. I had more fun and I did better. I performed better. It was oh, best experience. So then I knew, okay, this is going to be a part of who I am. Uh, I, unlike Alicia, was always like into coaching. Like I, I love the sport. So I went and asked for a job. Like, hi, can I coach with you? And I was like, oh, this is making me so nervous. I don't think she's going to say yes. But like, now I know free help. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we can just hit some ground balls you're in. <laughs> so I did that. And that was about all I was helpful for. Um, I dragged a field. That was helpful as well. So first two years coaching was like, I can teach the mental game. <laughs> you know, the, what's the, what's the effect where you think you're really good when you don't actually know anything, but then as you get older and actually learn the things you realize, Oh wow, there's a lot more to learn. <laughs> so got to two years after that, I decided I want to make this a career. And before I have kids, thank God I decided this, <laughs> I want to get my master's now and then start the coaching journey. Got my master's in sports psych, loved it. It was an applied focus. So they had us working with people the whole time, talking about these concepts and my favorite thing, making it actionable. So got to, went to a D1 job, used it there a couple of years, still wasn't quite as effective, honestly, as I wanted it to be. Went, got my own job, then I could have some more control over the practice plans and what we were working on. So I saw some gains for sure. But after three years as a head coach, once my husband got this job, I ended up leaving. And upon reflecting on the experience, I was pissed. I was so mad. I'm like, sports psych is supposed to be my thing. And my girls still struggled with confidence. They still struggled at the end of the season when the pressure was on from school, from sports, from the expectations of finally doing better for a program that had been working its way up, scratching and clawing. And I when I went into this business, I was like, okay, I know sports psych, but I don't, I don't really know what to do with it. Like, I don't, I'm not a consultant. You have to be certified to be a, a sports psych consultant. Like, I don't know what to do. So I realized, oh, I'm going to help coaches. <laughs> so I got good at implementing this into the game and through the three years with Alicia talking to some amazing coaches across the country, not just the big names, but just some amazing people really came to the realization that, wow, we coaches have so much more potential in ourselves too. So that's what brought us back here today. So Alicia is our consultant wing of the business and I work with coaches and I am just so excited to keep working with people and learning and leveling up how we teach the mental side of the game. I love it. And there's so many things that we can unpack and uh, your journeys are different. Your journeys are the same and ultimately led you to be where you are right now, which is business partners for this awesome venture that I've supported now for, I don't know, when first time I stumbled on your podcast, probably a year, year and a half ago, at least uh, at this point. And uh, you know, like you said, so many other people, but where I want to start talking a little bit more about you know, what you're doing and what you're hoping to accomplish um, is specifically around the word fun. Uh, and both of you mentioned that word um, at multiple points th throughout the introduction. Uh, and I think just speaking candidly, one of the reasons that this type of work maybe isn't more desirable for people uh, is because it is uh, difficult to do. It takes time. It's, it's not something that just happens overnight. And so when you say the word fun and you pair those things together, some people, their eyebrows raised, you know, they're, they're, the light bulb goes off and they're like, oh, oh, how does that actually work? So can we talk a little bit about you know, how we're, like you said, Mel, how we're making it not just actionable and something that we can 
uh, whether it's the players, whether it's the coaches, um, but how can we make this fun and be it something that we're not dreading on top of, you know, we're probably already dreading school. We're probably already dreading our homework that we have to do at night. How do we not make the softball experience a dreadful one? And whoever wants to take this, go go right ahead. I'm going to make Alicia go because the one thing I want to clarify is that fun doesn't mean fluffy. Yes. It doesn't just mean, like, let's do a game while we're at practice. <laughs> Alicia Smith is one of the most intense coaches I know on game day. Like, biggest competitor. And it is freaking fun to watch her girls play. <laughs> so I want her to take it this route and show that, like, it's not just about like, okay, then we're going to go out the pizza afterward. <laughs> Sometimes I forget you've seen me coach. Like it's been so long. Um, this is true. I, I don't apologize for my intensity. Um, but I think, but I think there's a really strong foundation that's, that has to be laid first by building the relationships with your kids, right? Because you can't be, you can't be tough on them and you, and you can't push them in the way that's to, to get the most out of them unless you build that relationship first. And that takes time and trust and it, effort like it has to be very you have to really make an effort to do so so i think that that's one of the most important things but in and i say this from experience i've been doing this for a long time and i've been through everything the ups and the downs and the winning and the losing and winning is fun don't get me wrong but losing losing doesn't have to suck because i think what happens is you lose sight of what you're actually there for and you lose sight of the process and i've made it my mission and my goal as a as a high school coach is to prepare my team the best I can for postseason, because that's always our goal. Is is to, our goal is always to win a state championship, and we've done really well. But it's a long season, right? Which isn't really long. It seems long when you're in it, but it's really only about eight weeks long. So you have about eight weeks, right, to really to really build those kids up, so they are confident in those and can play under pressure. So that that takes a lot of thought and effort into that. So sometimes, as a coach, though, you can get lost in the weeds. And it's, it happens often, and that's why Mel has been great to talk to, but you get so you get tied up in the details and you don't understand why your team is making nine errors in a game. And you get frustrated because they're frustrated and you can't quote unquote fix it, and that's not your goal. The goal as a coach is not to fix it because there isn't a problem to fix. If the kids are making nine errors, um, the couple things are going going wrong, right? So one, you got to figure it out. Is it, some, is it, are they distracted by something? Are they under too much pressure? Am I doing something that's making them feel like they can't make a mistake? What, so you got to take a step back. And one season I realized after that horrific weekend where we just got shellacked, we lost, we lost by like 15. Uh, I don't often get mercy, let alone 15 runs in three innings and have nine years in a game. That just doesn't happen. And I am so frustrated because I can't fix it. I had to take a step back. And my assistant coach actually had to do a virtual slap upside the head and said, remember why you coach. It has nothing to do with the trophies and the wins and losses. It has everything to do with those kids and developing them and giving them tools, right? So I also realized they just weren't having fun. So how can I help make it fun but still competitive? And I introduced a game. It was, I walked into a game and I hung up a big sign on the dugout and I said, we're playing softball bingo. And they looked at me and I had, I had pre-printed all the squares. And if, if they made an ESPN play or a double play or a home run or a single or got an RBI or anything that helped the team, they got to put their initials in. So it became competitive as well. And the kids loved it. But boy, were they trying out, the, out there making these ESPN plays and they would jump up and celebrate the plays and, and just kind of let go, right? And that just, that doesn't happen overnight. And it doesn't work in every situation. But what I had realized in, in that particular moment is that I lost the reason why I was coaching in the first place, right? Because it isn't about the winning. And when you can take that out of, out of your brain and you can really focus on the kids, the relationships you build with them and understand that losing and sucking is a part of the process, that helps you really kind of get out of that and then and find something. Yes, that, was, that wasn't fluffy because it was super competitive and it actually helped them get out of that too. Um, I, we've done all sorts of things. Uh, making competitive practices is fun. Winning, winning when you're competing is fun, but also supporting each other is fun, especially when things aren't going very well and you know that you have that team around you to support you is really, really, really what's truly important and it can help alleviate some of that stress. Yeah, and... I tend to, we talked about this when I was on your show, I tend to align with the way that Alicia coaches in my own 
style in, in a way that, it, you know, if I was a head coach of a, a team, for example, that's how I would go about it as well. I like the competitive aspect. One of my mentors is Larissa Anderson. That's the way that she goes about it at the University of Missouri for their softball team. So those type of what, what you just talked about, like especially the, the bingo card is something that's really standing out to me because it's, it's something that, like you said, you can have fun, but you can be competitive. And it doesn't take away from like the uh, what you need to do to actually get better on the field, right? Like you're, you're not um, taking just time away from, from getting better on the field. And, and, and so many times I think that's, that's where maybe some of the disconnect is too. But uh, what I'm wondering, and maybe Mel, you, you could tackle this, is – for somebody who their coaching style is different from mine or from Alicia's uh, or for someone like Larissa, uh, how could we go about it in another way uh, where, you know, maybe, maybe whether it's the coaching style or the team's just not ready uh, for that type of competitiveness, maybe they're a younger team, like what you were talking about, Mel, when you were 14, maybe you're just not ready for that yet. What are some other ways that we could go about it and, um, you know, still get the same effectiveness out of it? Love that. Good question. Uh, yeah, my style is definitely different. Uh, I'm more laid back, <laughs> kind of like overthinking in the corner. That that coach on the bucket who's like analyzing everything. <laughs> um, however, I think everybody has that competitive spark inside them. Like a lot of people say, that kids these days aren't competitive. B S. <laughs> Two big capital letters. Because if you've seen them play kickball or play something like any other silly little game sport those kids love to compete so you don't have to worry about them not learning competitiveness what you have to figure out is the way in so especially for younger kids a lot of them when you ask they're like the why do you play or if you ask them like okay when you go to your friends and you tell them that you play softball what do you say you love about it they love being with their friends they love having fun they love being in an atmosphere where they feel like they're a part of a family and at first coaches are like yeah but, but we gotta win too <laughs> we gotta develop your skills they do like that but you can get in through the door of connection with their teammates so you make team games you make partners you put them together and they're learning and growing with each other that's the way in to teach them what competitiveness is, what it can do for them and how it's not so scary on the field. It's not as threatening as what they make it out to be, which is why like off the field kickball is no big deal. Right. But in the sport that my parents are paying for or that and putting a lot of time into, I should be good. Sometimes you got to go in the back door and say, Hey, today you guys are working as teams. I really like this one. So if you have a partner, working as teams and your goal is to get so many points, make it a hundred <laughs> and then get points for different things throughout the day. Whatever you want to work on, if you're doing some hitting, so maybe it's a real young team, like 10 you, if you hit 10 line drives, you get 10 points. So they're trying to hit line drives, trying to hit line drives. Look, they're being competitive and they've got their teammate there cheering them on. So that's fun. And then they get to grounders. If they field every grounder, they field perfectly. They field it and stays in their glove. <laughs> That's perfect at that age, people. Then they get more points. So if you can tally up this system and keep them focused on the wins and how their teammate is winning too and encouraging each other, that's how you can build in that competitiveness from the viewpoint of what they love about the sport. Sorry to interrupt, but I want to help you get fit. Christine here from Sweat With Sods. Being at home has a lot of people in a rut with their workouts, but you don't have to be. My HIT at home workouts require no equipment and can be done in 30 minutes or less. And if HIT isn't for you, I also design custom programs that can be done virtually, in person, or a combination of both. I put my years of experience teaching classes and personal training into all of my programs. I've worked with lots of people and helped them achieve very different goals. So what are you waiting for? Head to sweatwithstats.com today. And don't forget that as a listener to this podcast, you can get a discount with code DYNAMIC at checkout. Can't wait to hear from you. And now, back to the show. So the two things that I'm picking up then, and Mal, when you started talking about that, you brought it back to what Alicia was saying earlier. It's about relationship building. It's about actually understanding, not just from like a coaching to a player perspective, but player to player you know, understanding who your teammates are and learning to trust them. And, and then you 
continue to talk about from there, I think what was like most interesting is celebrating these small wins within a practice where, you know, let's, let's just be fair <laughs> for, um, yeah, whatever it is, baseball and softball, those, those are, that's my sport. That's your sport. They're just slower sports. There's a lot of time where you're idle and you're standing around and in the middle of a practice, we're not even talking about a game, a baseball softball practice. If you're kind of just standing around and not really doing anything, it can get real easy to get distracted, to not care um, and, and so I love this idea of like having these these little games within that count for these little wins, uh, because I think it would help a little bit more with the focus and and these type of things can happen in, in other sports. But I think specifically with baseball and softball, where there there is that idle time and you can think a little bit too much or uh, just daydream or whatever it is. So I love these how we how we paired that together, how you uh, prepared that all together for us. My next question is around being able to flip that switch like in the moment, being able to use everything that you've learned, like everything that you teach in your boot camps and when you're consulting and everything that you're doing and you get to a moment like Alicia had in that game where there's no runners on base, you're starting to think ahead. If she was doing it, I'm sure there was other players on the field that were starting to do that. And I actually had, pretty much the same experience my junior year of high school we were one strike away two times from going to the final four in the state of new york and we did not win that game <laughs> uh, long story short um and so i can totally see and, and again you know baseball softball is like that that type of game where so many thoughts can start to, to go through and you could be standing around for like five minutes between pitches. If there's either a pitching change or there's a conference or somebody gets hurt or whatever it is. So, so how do we take the, the work going back to my original question, how do we take the work that we're doing and use it in a moment like what Alicia experienced and not let it spiral, not let it get out of control. How do we stop it like in its tracks and use it to our advantage? Do we, can we, work through that a little bit more? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. And I think that that's really the crux of what we're, we're trying to help with, right, in our business is to give the coaches the how piece, right? Because I'll give a quick example. I'm working with a team right now and the coach is like, I sent this video to them, coach. It's all about focus. So the video is, is a very short video. It's a Duke women's basketball coach. And, and she just simply says that focus is, is the bridge between um, explanation and execution. And I thought, that's great, and that's awesome to share with your team. But the biggest piece that's missing is in the middle is the how. How do you get the kids to focus, right? So obviously we talk about, you know, things that we have, you know, basically mental tools that can help get them to there. But I think from, from the overall coaching perspective, I'll let Mel talk a little bit more about the how. But from a coaching perspective, it's taking the how and implementing it into your practice every single day. And, and having this, like, just having a great practice plan on a spreadsheet that accounts for every minute is not, is not necessarily as important as the intention behind it. Mel and I are both very, like, if you look at our practice plans, man, and my kids make fun of me, actually, they're like, coach, we're off by two minutes on the practice plan. <laughs> like, so I appreciate that about them. That that's just the relationship piece, right? But I think what's important is that every line item is intentional because you cannot expect these kids to turn it on in a state championship game if you haven't practiced it since the first day you've been together right and that's and that is by putting them in those really tough situations in practice where there are consequences for not winning there are consequences for not getting the ball where you where you ask them to do um and i think too i wanted to kind of follow up too with I think these two, two combine, right, the answers. But from a coach's standpoint, yes, I'm super intense, but that intensity can sometimes be misplaced, right? If the intensity is not focused on the right thing, from a coach's standpoint, the kids play in fear, right? So I think that the intensity has to be from the coach, from my standpoint, is always on the controllables. The hustle, the vegan teammate, you know, sliding, those types of things. Because if you're not hustling when you totally can control that, I'm gonna get on you all day. But if you make an error, that happens. And when we focus too much as a coach on the outcome, as opposed to the process of getting there, because if I have a kid that dives for the first time and she misses the ball, I am celebrating that dive all day. Right. And I want to make sure that the kid knows the effort is awesome. Right. But what's, what's the intensity is also in a positive way. So if we make sure that our practice plans are intentional, 
and we make sure that the kids are actually practicing the mental part of the game inside every single day, then it does it becomes second nature. And it, and they have that ability when the consequences or the or the consequences and the circumstances are different, only perceived to be different, right? That's the key part. They're perceived to be different. It's still just a game. The stakes are quote unquote raised or higher because it could be a state championship game. That part is eliminated because they're just they've they've been through it so many times. It's no different. Yeah, I love it. There's so many good things in there. You know, whether you're talking about accidents having actual consequences, and that's a reality of life. Um, but then also, you know, rewarding effort and just knowing that even sometimes when, especially in our sports, uh, when when you do everything right, you can still make an out, you can still fail, and that doesn't mean that you should be punished or that you should feel bad about it. Um, you just, again, need to know that you put your best effort in and, and that's really what's most important. Um, so I, I love all that. And I'd like to get through a couple quick hitters uh, here um, just for people that you know, maybe are looking for places to start with all this type of work. And um, I'd love to give you both an opportunity to talk about what is the the first part of the question is what is one area that you would recommend like for the, the type of work that we're we're all doing here what's what's like the the first thing that we need to do to get going um and then the second part is what's what's one of the the most fun things you can think of um to make the experience more fun and less dreadful i know we talked about some uh, different games and things like that but just you know quick quick hitters that can get people started if they're looking for some actionable things to take away from this episode. We'll go, we'll go with Mel first this time. <laughs> well, this is actually great timing for this question. Um, Cause I am in the middle of finishing up touches on what I'm coaching the calling the coaches. Oh my gosh. Calling the coaching impact <laughs> accelerator where we're talking about how to build these things into your practice plan, how to make it a purposeful process. And I think one of the first things that I want to share with everybody, not just in that program, is we need to reframe how we talk about, think about, and approach failure. I think us coaches now, we've been through enough failure that we realize those things aren't a big deal, but they don't. To them, failing in an at-bat or giving up a home run as a pitcher, that to them feels just as bad as one of us losing our job. Like that's how intense it is for them. So I think we need to A, realize that and empathize a little bit and then B, give them more opportunities on purpose in an environment that's safe to fail over and over and over again and see that, yes, you're still okay. This is how you get through it. This is how you conquer it next time or at least get a little better. And then when they see that, that's the process building on itself, right? So I think that is the number one thing every coach, teacher, adult with kids can do is show your kids that failing is just a moment in time. It's a failure. It doesn't make you a failure. I even do it with my three-year-old and he cracks me up. <laughs> but like they get it. They understand that if you can keep teaching it to them over and over, basically giving them more reps like with everything else we do. They learn how to be able to short hop. I think that is harder than dealing with failure sometimes. <laughs> And I would say to, to build off that is, is kind of like the misplaced intensity is to just focus on the process and not focus on the outcome. So I think as coaches, we can get so wrapped up in the outcome. As parents, we can get so wrapped up in the outcome. As kids, we get so wrapped up in the outcome. And that's because we're so used to that, right? The only thing like that we focus on are what, did, what grade did you get? Right? What was your final grade? Or what grade did you get on the test? Not how much effort did you put into the test? The grade is just what you've earned, right? And the consequences of all the decisions that you made leading up to that grade helped you earn that. Whether you whether you studied for the you know five days a little bit every day, or did you try to cram at three a.m. Like all of those things. So stop focusing the outcome. Just focus on the process. And if and if the kid messes up, let him fail, because it's okay. And I think that's that's hard as coaches. That's hard as parents. It's really hard to sit back and watch your kid fail and know they're going to without without helping them along, but you gotta let them. And, and I think experiencing that as a mom is definitely the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Right. But I also think that, um, as coaches, we have a tendency to do that and parents on the sidelines don't help. Right. So instead of just focusing on the fact that you just struck out, 
focused on the fact that the kid had a great at bat. Because I've seen what parents can do from the sidelines. I've seen what coaches can do from the sidelines. And I know myself what I've done to kids when you put that misplaced uh, intention and pressure on them. So for, for that, for sure, just stop focusing on the outcome, focus on the effort. Focus on the, on the details of the process and the decisions that you've made in order for that, when that outcome happens, right? And secondly, as far as a team goes, um, I think from my experience, the best thing you can do is take a day during the season and, and put away your bat, your ball, and the gloves and do something fun. It can still be competitive. It doesn't have to be a game. We've done things like made a whole day of the softball Olympics, right? And there's some silly games like where you put the bat on your head and you spin around and see who can run straight. I mean, silly things like that. It, it just kind of, rem- the kids are just like alleviated from the pressure of actually performing all the time. And it just gives them a chance to breathe because it, and kids in high school have so much going on. And I think be, by giving them time to do something fun in a team environment that is still competitive is really good for team bonding and it's good for the coaches and it's just good to laugh sometimes. And I think when you can pull away from the sport that you're in the middle of the season and actually just do something that has nothing to do with the sport is really refreshing for the entire team and coaching staff included. I love it. Those were awesome points uh, from both of you. Really great actionable things that I think we can do from a team perspective to get started and then also have some fun, really great things. And I want to also give you both an opportunity. We've talked so much about the type of work that you're doing. And I want to talk specifically now about your partnership together, talk about some of the things I know you have upcoming here in Q1 for 2021 upcoming here. So uh, tell us a little bit. Uh, we can just go alphabetically again, Alicia, if you want to kick it off and then and then Mel can top it off. But tell us a little bit about what's going on, what do you have coming up and where we can find you. Sure. Um, I will let Mel shoot all the social media stuff out. Um, <laughs> but she, on where to find us, but what I work on uh, or I work with teams, I consult with teams um, and we, and I will work with the whole team, including the coach, right? So we have, we have a full blown program um, that includes actionable things, right? To do every single uh, week with your team to help the coaches start to build those actionable things into practice, because that's, that's kind of a hard thing to do if you don't know what the how is, right? So for, first they learn about the how, and then they're able to do some drills and some things so they can help build that in their practice. And I think the coolest thing for me is I'm working with Team in Canada right now, and they'll send little videos on our, on our app. We have an app for each one of the uh, teams that they can kind of, we can have a private section on the app to talk and post things. But anyway, they shoot the videos of the actual drills and they're all with their notebooks and they're writing stuff down. And, and that's pretty cool because the kids just, we, we work through the C's, we call them the seven C's. We help the team first build the culture, uh, a strong culture, because I believe truly that's, a, that's the foundation of everything. Uh, that's everything to a successful team. But without having a strong culture first, it's even harder for kids to learn about things like confidence, right? Controlling their emotions and things like that. Because when you don't have that strong culture, it's not as easy, right? So I firmly believe that's how it takes the team to the next level is having a strong culture. That's what uh, is key to, to my program as well. But each week we build on... E- a different C, right? So we give the kids these actionable things too to do. Uh, They journal a lot, which I think is super important when you're uh, honest with yourself and you can really take a step back and reflect where you've you've come from, how far you've been and where you are and where you want to be. So that's what we really work with these these teams. Um, Every single week we build on, each C builds on each other. And then by the time that we're done, uh, they've gone through the whole program. They're a stronger team, they're more confident, they realize that they don't need to put all this pressure on themselves. They figure out kind of why they're there in the first place. They learn how to set goals. Um, they build in routines that are mental as well as physical. And then the coaches have the tools to walk away to be able to help support them after the, the consulting is over that can continue right into the season and beyond. Yeah. So yeah, I'll plug the social media since I'm in charge of it. Uh, yeah, we just ran a couple of boot camps, one for teams most recently, another one for coaches. So keep an eye out for the next round of those. But in the meantime, we've got our podcast, mentalsweetspot.com forward slash softball dash podcast, or just go to your podcast app of choice. That's what I do. Uh, so you can follow both these podcasts now. Um, and then you'll find out about anything coming up through there or on our website. And just another 
plug on my side of things. I work with the coaches to make sure that you're doing what you need to do <laughs> every day in practice to keep building the things that Alicia teaches the girls. So she really will get in there and teach the girls these skills. Like it took me till my senior year to learn, <laughs> but she gets them going and then you can carry it through using the skills that I teach on my side. But just love what we do. We work with awesome people. So shout out to our sweet spotters. We love you all. Colin, you are one. So welcome to the club. <laughs> I, I love it. And I, I, seriously, I can't recommend the, the work that you're doing enough. I think it's so important, especially, you know, at the amateur level for uh, lack of a better phrase. I mean, that, that is where this, this is the sweet spot for this type of work. And so you know, I don't think it's any surprise that that is the, the partnership that you formed. And I love the dynamic of how you go about it, where one of you tackles the, the team and the player side, one of you handles uh, the coaches and working to your strengths probably there with everything and um, just so much good material. I mean, we talked about so much today and we've already had multiple conversations, the three of us, and I'm sure those will continue <laughs> into the, into the future as well. But I uh, definitely recommend you know, everyone take a look at, at everything that Mel just plugged for those different sites and social handles. We'll make sure we tag you when this episode releases as well, but I can't thank you ladies enough for taking some time today to tell us about everything that you did, share your expertise, expertise. Uh, I'm just certainly wishing you the best of luck with everything in the future and looking forward to following along as well. Thank you so much, Colin. Appreciate, you know, all of our conversations as well. And not only you as a guest, but just, you know, as, as another person in the right space that you're our people, that's what we say, right? You're in it for the right reasons and, and we love talking to you. So thank you for having us on today. Yes, thank you.